Okay. So. Yeah. Um, thanks a lot for the kind introduction. Thanks, Dr. Peak and Clemens, for inviting me. It's a it's an exciting pleasure again <laughs> to be standing in front of a real audience. That's really my first travel in like two and a half years or so. Um, yeah. So thanks a lot. So when you invited me, I was hoping to be able to talk about isotope shift measurements. Um, so far, experiments um, look kind of weird. So I also added like a bonus track for today, where we also at the end of my talk um, talk about a little bit about a new development, which is um, ring laser gyroscopes. So to start off, um, we in my group share the excitement that many of you also share, which is do precision measurements, but just not for adding another digit somewhere, but for doing something useful. And there's something useful can be geodesy or can be astronomy or can be looking into fundamental physics. And here I put some of sort of the probably the most pressing and most challenging um, topics that modern physics sees today. For example, baryon asymmetry. So we have a large, large project on this one here where we try to measure the, um, the electric dipole moment of the neutron using a valence neutron in ultra cold mercury. Um, so I will not talk about this today, but this is kind of related to what we are doing and what might be also interesting for you guys. Um, however, we'll talk to you, um, I will not talk to you about variation of fundamental constants, which is a topic that many of you cover. That is, of course, dark matter searches, searches for any new particles, which might be dark or might not be dark. Then gravity and test of general relativity might be on your agenda of your favorite topics, um, measuring neutron masses, test of QD, all these kind of fundamental um, topics that fall into sort of the realms of cold atom or low energy measurements. Okay. Um, and today I want to talk about um, the search for new particles um, through isotope shift measurements. Um, yesterday I, I was visiting many groups at PDB and I learned that also many of you are quite active in this field. So it's like, how do you say, oil nach Athen tragen, carrying out to Athens. So who am I to tell you something about isotope shift measurements? So I will try to give a broad introduction and then um, show some of the measurements that we did. Yesterday. Okay, so we started with this endeavor like two years ago. Um, where, I mean, we all know that there must be something else than normal ordinary matter, which is dark matter, which we don't know yet if we should envision this as a real particle or some field or something, so, but there must be something else. Then last year, there were new muon G minus, G minus two measurements, where there'd been the old Brookhaven measurements, and they transported this ring from Brookhaven to Fermilab. Then after a very short measurement and film, they could sort of confirm the old measurements, having, as I said, three here, 3.3 3 sigma deviation from standard model. Um, which again points in a precision measurement to there must be something else that we're not yet aware of. Um, also last year, there was the um, publication of Lepton Universality. So this is um, this one here from HCB. So you go in with the beauty um, meson, end up with the strange meson. Can you see my pointer? Yes, you can. Um, and what you do is you look at the rates normalized by the masses of the leptons and you find that there's um, a higher probability um, for this beauty mesons to decay into muons than into electrons. So it's a higher for electrons than to muons after normalizing to the mass. So um, this is entirely not understood because people believe that leptons are all the same apart from the masses, but they seem to couple differently to quarks. And one explanation could be that there's um, so-called lepto quarks that couple, in this case, a beauty quark to a lepton and this coupling could be different. So again, um, a hint, let's say, that there's something else um, going under, there might be additional particles. So sort of in this wake of finding or trying to search for new particles, there was a um, famous suggestion um, by a range of theoreticians and also experimentalists last year, that is to look at isotope shift measurements to search for a fifth force, um, a new scalar boson that will couple hadrons, protons and neutrons in the nucleus to the electrons. Because that's something we can measure, we can measure very precisely energies between neutrons and electrons. So this is those, the, the Feynman diagram. This would be like a Yukawa type potential. It's the one over R that's cut off by an exponential. And the typical range is the Compton wavelength, so one over the mass of the particle. And then you see these funny um, colorful diagrams here, where you have the mass of this new scalar boson and the coupling strength. So you can only sort of make a 2D diagram of the coupling strength of the mass. And they can sort of uh, certain, certain um, parameter ranges have been excluded already through his force measurements. And there's here G minus two of the neutron. And you can couple with the supernova data and globular clusters, sort of um, large scale um, evolution of, of stellar cosmic objects. Then you can exclude certain things. And then you can look at sort of um, sensitivities that you could reach if you did spectroscopy and calcium plus with 100 kilohertz, blah, blah. Then you can sort of um, look at certain levels at which you can exclude certain parameter ranges here. And of course, we're doing spectroscopy of electronic systems. 
Um, so we are somewhere in this range here between angstrom and the femtometer, so about the size of a, of a Bohr radius and the size of a nucleus, because we can only probe the range in between the nucleus and the electronic orbital. Okay, to put this into a little bit more of a, of a, of a qualitative um, um, description, um, this is almost the only math slide I have today. So um, we call this frequency here, see here the, the isotope shift of a transition alpha. So transitions will be labeled alpha and beta between two isotopes I and J. So the difference in the transition frequency of a transition alpha between two isotopes depends on a range of, 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 of factors. The first one is the field shift, as you know from your know, fourth semester atomic physics classes, um, which has um, a component of the electronic orbital and of the nuclear property, in this case, sort of the, the size of the nucleus. And if you want to look at the isotope shift, it's the change in the size of the nucleus going from isotope I to J. This is called the field shift and usually on the gigahertz scale. Second contribution is the so-called mass shift, which is sort of the interaction of the mass. So you add another neutron to the, to the nucleus, so the mass increases. There's sort of the back action of the electronic orbital, and then there's the reduced mass. It's on the range of megahertz. Then you have, of course, to all of this, you have a higher order effect. So second order field shift is sort of the square of this one here. That's in here. That's on the kilohertz scale. And then um, that's the hypothesis of having new physics, which could be um, the coupling strength of a neutron to an electron um, times the overlap of the nucleus with the, with the electron wave function. And AJI is sort of the addition, you put one more neutron into this. Okay, um, so there's many different coefficients here, and we can try to remove some of them. And the first step is to um, normalize by the mass shift as we go from one isotope to the next. And the second one is to use a second um, optic and transition to remove the field shift. Um, so then you can get rid of two of these components here. And then the magic looks like this. So this is the relative. So the the ratio between two isotope shifts on two optical transitions. So then um, the isotope shift on transition beta depends on the isotope shift of transition alpha plus an offset plus a certain number of terms. So this is just a linear equation. It's an offset, it's a linear term, and then some, something nonlinear, which could be quadratic or could be freaky, could be something. And this is then either higher order terms or new physics of whatever type. Um, and this is called the King plot, and this has been around for decades. Um, then um, what system should you use to try to measure with high sensitivity these kink plots? Um, this is sort of our wish list. Um, you want to have, of course, an element that can be laser, cool to low temperatures. You can see spectroscopy on this and so on. Then you need at least four stable isotopes. We want to look at um, non-linearities. So you have at least three data points. You would always like, to, you need to compare two isotopes. So you need at least four isotopes to do three comparisons. So you have sort of enough points um, to, to look at nonlinearities. Um, and then you want to have two optical transitions that should be relatively narrow, so you can measure with high precision. And to my knowledge, this gets you down to these um, six elements down here, um, many of which you know from optical clocks and so on. Then I call this the era of linear king plots, um, because since the, the 80s or so, people have been measuring king plots. And we have one example here um, from Pete Schmidt's group, calcium plus ions, where everything aligns nicely here on this, on this linear slope here. So within the error bus, everything is on the linear slope. And there's also work on, on mercury, there's work on many other um, elements. And down here, I tried to put a list of, 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 of experiments in the past. This is probably not complete, but just shows that this has been around for, for many years in various groups. And it seems to me, whoever did um, spectroscopy also, if they had sufficiently many isotopes, did isotope shift spectroscopy just to um, have the king plot and see, okay, where well, the nice line on the slope. Then um, was what I call the era of nonlinear king plots um, on a terbium. So this was two years ago, um, where Vlad and Vulotic at MIT first presented um, measurements that significantly deviated from linear slope. So um, he's doing spectroscopy on the S to D transition. So this is kind of forbidden. It's going to two different D states. Um, and if you look at some broad scale, they align on the linear slope. But if you zoom out a more closely, you see that within the error bus, they do not align on the slope anymore. There seems to be something strange going on. Then if you sort of rearrange the X axis um, and divide by one another, um, you get this one here, but you see that the topology is the same. It's up, down, up, down. So there's a, scat there's a staggering of these, of these isotope shifts. And the staggering um, might be important. Um, and we call this the nonlinearity measure, which is 
you um, you sum over adjacent data points. Then so up, down, up, down makes a difference between down, up, up, down, for example. So you look at the staggering either up, down, up, down, or plus, minus, plus, minus versus down, up, up, down. Then if you look at this, um, at this one here, um, this is different whether it's staggered up, down, up, down, or whether it's sort of a, a curved behavior. And what they find that it's staggered, you can see this, it's up, down, up, down, so that um, within the uncertainty, it's somewhere here. Um, this zeta plus value is sort of more, is larger than the um, zeta minus. And then you can put up some um, first theory of what this might be, whether it's a quadratic field shift, this would be the, the blue dash line here, whether it's a new boson of, I mean, the slope is undetermined, right? This can be any slope, but sort of a line in this direction, or in this case, sort of this way, and would indicate um, that's a new boson. So it's somewhere here. So they write a paper that they call evidence for nonlinear isotope shift in the search of a new boson, which is kind of, um, how do you say, um, okay, you can do this or you can't. I mean, calling this here, um, favoring a new boson is kind of um, <laughs> brave. I mean, you could do it on already in the, in the abstract, they say, can, um, it's hard to separate this from nuclear effects. This can be anything, but this triggered an, a new sort of initiative in your field and where people are now looking more closely into the isotope shift measurements and trying to understand what's going on. And then this, I, I think this was, yeah, maybe it needs such a flashy paper and such a flashy title to, to get people, uh, people's attention. And in the wake of this experiment, there were more experiments. And um, this one is from Dima Butka here in Mainz, um, who did neutral terbium. And he also finds up, down, down, up. And this is funny, right? Before I was making a case, it was down, up, down, up. And now he's seeing up, down, down, up. So it's a different, a different, different scattering, a different staggering. So it's, it's, it's curved, it's not the checkerboard pattern. And then um, came the, the notion of nuclear deformation. Um, that nuclear deformation also leads to um, these isotope shifts taking funny, funny, funny shapes. Um, and in this graph here, Dima Butgert's um, data seems to favor the nuclear deformation. This is far away from, from new boson physics. This is just plain old sort of nuclear physics um, of a heavily deformed nucleus, which if you add another neutron becomes, has a different shape. So you can understand that the isotope shift also changes um, if you add another boson, uh, another neutron um, because the shape changes. And there was more work. Um, then Bladan did another experiment um, where he probed on the, on the octopole transition. Um, and the data I showed before was this up, down, up, down. And on the octopode transition, it's up a little bit down, down, up again. So you're seeing different behaviors and different transitions, um, which again says that not all of this came in your physics. There's all sort of nuclear physics that goes into it. And the new physics or search for new bosons overwhelmed by nuclear effects. Same, um, roughly the same time, um, Yoshiro Takahashi had neutral terbium data also measuring, two diff measuring the clock transition in terbium and comparing this to the two clock transitions in, um, in terbium ion. Um, and he, then he's having sort of three transitions that he can compare, the two from the ion and his neutral transition. They can make a 3D king plot. And so you have five isotopes, so four pairs. You can sort of span the three-dimensional space and you have a plane in the space. And then you can look at the deviations of your data points from the plane. Um, and there's this one here. So you see, hmm, maybe <laughs> they're all kind of on the line, but you don't really know. And it seems to be again some up, the down, up, down, up, stag scattering, uh, staggering. But it's kind of, it, it, the signal disappears if you take into account more, more, more data points. And I guess the conclusion is um, we need to understand the nuclear physics first, or we need to understand to a very high level before we, so that we can remove the nuclear physics and then um, come to look or conclude anything about possible new physics. By the way, I didn't say this. Um, this one here was 240 sigma evidence for nonlinearity. So there's some nonlinearity, but we don't know what it is. And maybe it ends up being nuclear physics, which, we, which is great, but which we might not be interested in. Okay, um, so this is kind of the, I guess the, maybe you have a different opinion, but this, I guess, is kind of the, the state of the art right now. And I think what we should worry about now is nuclear um, deformations. Um, so this is a plot that I learned a lot from um, or which started our activities. So ytterbium is plagued by um, nuclear deformations. It's sitting right here. It has sufficiently many isotopes. Everything is fine. And um, but sitting right here, 
in the in this sort of peak of nuclear deformations, which you don't want to have and which we can hardly control and which we might not be interested in. Um, in our lab, we have the Mercury machine, which we mainly use for the EDM measurements, but which we're now using for the um, for the isotope shift measurements, because um, proton number 82 would be nuclear shell closure, and which means it's this blue line here, which is sort of essentially free of nuclear deformations. Um, and the mercury is um, nuclear, a proton number 80, so it's close to the nuclear shell closure. So the, the nuclear is relatively round, and we hope to be relatively free of these nuclear deformations. That's why we were thinking that it, uh, mercury might be a good candidate to, to, to look at. So um, when I was saying before here, there's a nonlinear term that competes with this new boson term that we are searching for. Um, it's, it's effectively almost at least two terms. One is the quadratic field shift, and one is the nuclear deformation. And now we're trying to get rid of the nuclear deformation here by choosing an element that is supposed to have little nuclear deformations. Um, this is the level scheme for mercury. Um, it's the same as yttrium, calcium, strontium, whatever, a neutral. Um, only all of the transitions are much further into the UV. So the main cooling transition, which is 461 nanometer and strontium, is not 185 nanometers. Um, the triplet intercombination lines are around 254 nanometers for the cooling transition. Um, so the bad news is it's also fine to the UV. The good news is that the large mass of mercury leads to all of this hyperfine coupling and the transitions become very broad. So we can also use in the combination lines, which appear here at the megahertz for, for, for cooling. So yeah, cooling, we're operating our magneto optic trap at um, 254 nanometers. Um, and then to spectroscopy, I will show you the data of this pinkish transition here and these other two transitions up here. And right now in the lab, we're doing this blue transition here. So um, Mercury has been around since uh, 10 years, maybe 12 years. Pacaturi did the first Mercury mods for clock operation. There's been one experiment, or there still is an experiment at CERT in Paris. And there's one, um, Thomas Walter in Darmstadt. And there used to be a few, like one in Arizona, which is, I think, not in existence anymore. There's a few Mercury machines around but they were mostly meant for clock operation. So people didn't really optimize on atom number, people didn't really optimize on temperature, they just want to have a few atoms to do spectroscopy on. I would claim that we were the first ones to look at mercury in a sense of, um, of uh, quantum degeneracy, many atoms, low temperatures, high phase space density and so on. Um, so um, yeah, this is our, our data um, where we could show that we can stably trap 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 8 atoms that mean to optical trap and um, temperatures are sub Doppler for the fermions and Doppler temperatures for the bosons and um, so that comes in the end at below 100 micro Kelvin, 30 micro Kelvin for the fermions and it's all kind of well behaved and if you kind of um, treat these UV lasers nicely um, you can you can nicely work with them. So bottom line is we have like 10 to the 7 to the 8 atoms of a whole range of isotopes here so we, this is the starting point for our, our um, isotope shift measurements. Then I will show you first the data for the 254 transition, which is ground state to a triplet P1. That's this one here. So this was from last summer. So if you look at it from a distance, it's um, all on a slope, on a linear slope. And, and then if you look at the deviations, you see that um, outside of the error bars, they deviate from a linear slope. And we again see the staggering up, down, up, down. But what's surprising now is um, the data I showed you before was on clock transitions, right? That was Hertz scale. Um, and this is now on a megahertz transition and um, with about 10 kilohertz error bar. Um, so here, we, and then we did a lot of uh, light shift and B fields and whatever systematics um, to try to reduce the error bars. And this, I think, a little bit exaggerated here. Um, so the error bars, I think, are blown up to about a kilo, 100 kilohertz or so. So in total, we see like half a megahertz, we call this megahertz level deviations from a linear slope, which is entirely not understood, right? In the data before for ethereum, which was supposed to be pretty bad in terms of nuclear deformation, um, they were seeing um, at the, say, 100 hertz level deviations. And now for an element that should be better behaved, we see megahertz level deviations, which we don't understand. And, and so far, nobody understands. And um, so we're collaborating with um, Julian Berengut and Ben O'Hagan for, for theory support. And also they don't know what's going on. So then we said, okay, um, the most dominant contribution to any isotope shift is the field shift. 
and then the what's bothering us. So now that we hope that we excluded the um, the, the nuclear deformation term by choosing an element that should be relatively close to nuclear shell closure, um, then the quadratic field shift is probably the, the leading order nonlinear term. So let's try to remove the um, second the, the quadratic field shift. And we do this by going to an orbital that's not an S state because S states have the largest wave function over with the nucleus. So we try to go, for example, P to D transition, where we hope that um, the orbitals have, I mean, in the, in the textbook picture, there would P to D have, would have no wave function overlap with the nucleus. This is true only the simple case for these heavy atoms, heavy elements, which are relativistic nuclei, it's only suppressed by this term here. So that is the proton number that alpha squared over three is about one over 10 in mercury. So for transitions, not including an S state for these heavy relativistic atoms, we expect a suppression of the field shift by a factor of 10 and second order field shift should be suppressed by a factor of 100. Okay, so we did spectroscopy on triplet P1 to triplet D1 and D2. So that's this pinkish lines here. So we also built a laser at 330 nanometer, which I learned is also very popular um, in, in the orange back end here. We followed, we don't need a lot of power. So we did, uh, we had have home build systems where we used the fifth harmonic of a telecom laser. So we have a 1550 fiber laser, then do the second harmonic, the third harmonic, and then mix the second and third harmonic. That gives us a few milliwatts of light at 313, which is entirely sufficient for what we're doing. And as I didn't say this before, all our lasers are locked to Menlo cavity, so they are all sort of, sort of stable. Um, and this also holds for this one here. That's why telecom is nice. So you can have nice cavities and you lock to the cavities and you're fine. Okay, um, this is the result. Um, again, it's linear if you look at it from a distance, but if you look more closely, it's down, up, up, down. Um, and there is a nonlinearity which we did not hope to see. <laughs> so again, here, the line is like six megahertz. Uh, we see megahertz type of shifts, although field shift and quadratic field shift should be suppressed. Quadratic field shift should be suppressed by a factor of 100, and there should be an element relatively free of nuclear deformations. And still, we see this huge shifts, um, which, is, um, which we don't understand. <laughs> um, now we can do the same trick as the other did before. If you have three transitions, um, you can do this 3D king plots. And also in the 3D king plots, the signal does not vanish. It's even more pronounced than what I showed you before. Um, and remember what I showed you before was at say Hertz to hundred Hertz level. Here it's at the megahertz level. For nucleus, they should be more well behaved and show less nuclear, uh, nuclear um, perturbations or nuclear artifacts. Okay, and then what do we do? Um, so this is, yeah, so even nuclear deformation should be smaller, we still see it. Um, quadratic field shift should be reduced by a factor of 100, we still see it. Um, I don't know if you remember, there was in Samarium, there's a freaky case where um, there's two near degenerate electronic levels. Um, so they were seeing in the 80s funny isotope shifts, but only such that one isotope was very far away from the other ones. This is not the case here, so there's no near degenerate arbitrary levels somewhere in the in the vicinity. And these non energies are stable over time. So experiments have been going for a year or so. Um, and this here is a plot of sort of different measurements over many, many months, changing cavities, changing locks, changing laser systems, changing temperature, changing BP, whatever. Um, and you see the width is, um, what is it, about 10 megahertz or so, but they are very stably sort of aligned, right? So it's not that they jump back and forth by a lot. Um, maybe they jump by 100 kilohertz or so, um, but we can we can fit the center of the line to like 10 or 15 kilohertz. So um, of course you never know, but we don't expect any yeah any any. This is probably some systematic, but we don't know yet what it is. Um, what is, however, interesting and what kind of makes sense is if you do this um, non-linearity non measure, the staggering, you see that all transition comparisons containing an S state align on this um, first and third quadrant, whereas the ones that don't contain an S appear on this one here. So they appear on the other diagonal. So there's some sense to the measurements, <laughs> at least. Um, yeah. Right now, um, we're doing spectroscopy on another, um, on the triplet P to triplet S transition. 
to find sort of another value that's different from the ground state SJ, probes different orbitals, but so there's S to P to try to put in other data points somewhere here. And yeah, let's see where it aligns. If anybody has a good idea on how to solve this, um, please come forward and tell us. <laughs> um, okay, so what should we do? What do we learn? Um, it seems that these nuclear um, properties are hard to control and not in the field of our expertise. And maybe we should resort to some that has less nuclear effects, but still allows for, um, for isotope shift measurements, meaning has at least four better five stable isotopes. So we are go going for the other side, sort of on the spectrum in, in weight, the mass of the nuclei, which we're going to calcium because calcium is the lightest element that can be laser cooled and has um, at least four different isotopes. So by doing neutral calcium, which is at the nuclear shell closure as proton number 20, and the neutral number spans all the way from 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, and 26 is magic again. So calcium is a unique case where you can sort of span the entire range between nuclear cell closures in the neutrons and it's magic for the protons. And it has five stable isotopes. And we're here in, in Braunschweig and Hanover. So there's a lot of experience in calcium already that we hope to compare our neutral calcium data to um, calcium ions and to the highly charged calcium ions at some other point. So um, yeah, this is what I said before, many isotopes, um, the relative shift given the small mass is large, um, we expect little or the least nuclear deformation you can get. It's not relativistic, so you can, can, can understand the core very well. You can compare to ions and nuclear highly charged ions. And in Bonn, we have um, Ulf Meissner, who's doing a lot of computation and he claims he can calculate the calcium nucleus. So it's also sort of input for benchmarking um, nuclear calculations of the, of the uh, nuclei. We will um, try to spectroscopy on two transitions. Um, this intercombination line, 270 hertz wide in the red, and there's another one here, one is either to triplet D1, or D2, I'm sorry, in the blue. So these are two narrow, so sub, sub kilohertz. Um, and then we are right now setting up um, a calcium beam clock. So we are heavily stealing um, knowledge from Andrew Ludlow's group at NIST, um, where you do Ramsey Baudet. I don't know how much into detail I should go here, but you do Ramsey Baudet, which cancels first order Doppler. And then second order, you can measure by measuring the, the velocity profile. And then his invention was, so you go, if you go one way and then you have four beams running through the, through the optical beam path, you get sort of wavefront deformations and that moves and distorts your signal. But then if you have one beam this way, one beam this way, I don't know if one can see me on the camera, <laughs> um, then the wavefronts you sample once in one direction and then the other way in the other direction and this cancels. So if you take the average of these two signals, then you can cancel away from deformation and that allows for a very clean signal. Um, and they got to a 10 minus 16 or something within a second or a few seconds or so. So um, why are we doing it this way? Because we want to do simultaneous co-located spectroscopy of two isotopes simultaneously. So we are doing spectroscopy on a common beam in sort of two closely spaced um, 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 interrogation sections, but it's on the same beam in the same temperature profile, derived from the same laser, um, trying to cancel all, syst all or many systematics. Um, yeah, so simultaneously, so we don't do measurement today and one next week, simultaneous interrogation co-located at the very same position. And there we hope to get down to like millihertz um, kind, of, kind of level. Um, yeah, so we have a prototype that was a master student and that's almost operational now. And now we're sort of playing the main, the main device. Um, we'll see where this gets us, but I think it's, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that maybe we can solve this or we can attack this issue from coming from the low mass elements. Okay. Um, and then I want to spend the last 10 minutes or so to um, advertise an entirely different topic. Um, so this goes away from atoms. It goes still toward precision measurements and kind of move towards geodesy. So um, we are starting to try to develop a novel concept for ring laser gyroscopes for measuring the sub daily variations in earth or in earth rotation. So um, earth is rotating. Um, and we will think that it's stable, um, but it's not. Um, this also goes back to an optical clock or clock development that took mankind a while to find that earth rotation not at all stable. 
Um, I will even put it the other way around that the rotation of Earth is a beautiful sensor because Earth is so susceptible to all kinds of external internal perturbations. So it's sort of coupling of the crust to the mantle region, a mantle to, to, to crust and crust to atmosphere, coupling to the moon, coupling to the sun, coupling to all kinds of phenomena. So I can use the Earth rotation as a sensor for all kinds of, of, of effects. Um, and some of the effects are given here. So there's tidal friction with the moon. You can look at geodesy, so post-glacial rebound and seawater rise. So you see water rise um, from climate change transfers to, to a, um, slowing down of Earth rotation. There's all kinds of couplings that are poorly understood, but which you have an access to now. Um, then Earth rotation parameters uh, or Earth rotation parameterized in three parameters. So one is the coordinate of the rotation axis as it sort of pokes through the ice sheet at the North Pole. And one is the length of the day. So the time it takes the Earth to rotate once around. Um, the first are called polar motion. Then you've probably seen this, um, this figures before um, that there's a, a motion of the Earth rotation axis and also polar warner. So it moves a little bit over time. And um, this is kind of well understood. And also um, the length of the day, I need to do the, all the clock people, I didn't need to show this, but just to show that um, the length of the day is varying at all time scales and it's very irregular, right? So there's a daily variation, um, weekly, bi-weekly, monthly from the coming to the moon, yearly, over decades, there's the gender wobble, which is seven years or so, so the beat is seven years. And it's crazy, it just goes around, it's, 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 it's random. Um, Earth rotation these days is measured from the RBI. So you look at or on array of radio telescopes, looks at an array of distant pulsars or quasars radio sources that look point-like. And then from this, you can, there's the International Earth Rotation Service, which is this one here. And you can download a table that tells you that this is the data for last week. Um, so it's only post-process. You can only, on Thursday, they upload the data for last week. So you can look at um, what was the um, correction to the length of the day and what is the position of the North Pole. And you see this is nine, 0 0.09, so 90 micro arc seconds which is about three millimeters. So it can tell you what is the position of the rotation axis to within three millis millimeters. And the um, error in the correction to UT UTC or UT1 is about 10 microsecondish, which is great, right? I mean, this, this is already pretty bizarre. Um, however, um, there's a little, little funny effect. It seems that the correction to UT1 jumps from one day to the other by about 100,000 uh, microseconds just jumps from one day to the other, um, whereas the uncertainty measures about 10 microseconds. That's kind of a strange data, right? The, um, the length of the day seems to jump from one day to the other by a thousand microseconds, and they claim to be able to measure within 10 microseconds. That um, looks a little bit strange. And also um, this DUT is defined only as a 24 hour average. So they make no claims whatsoever about the sub daily variations. They just give you the 24 hour average and this jumps back and forth from one day to the other. The reason is this one here, that there's huge variations throughout the day. So um, the Earth rotation slows down and accelerates throughout the day. It's by far not constant. The 24 hour average is relatively constant, but there's huge variations in between. So um, this is, if you would sort of transform this into length of the day, there's a 10 millisecond variation throughout the day but they can measure the average to 10 microseconds. So it's sort of huge amplitude, but the average is relatively well known. And you see it oscillates um, over the course of a day. And you see this um, half a month, so 14 days is half of the time it takes the moon to, to circle around the earth. So you see this beating with the phases of the moon. Okay, so um, pink data here is VLBI data. But usually um, VLBI, has um, measurement times on Monday and Thursday for like half an hour or so. That's when they use VLBI networks to look at sort of the, the distant stars and determine Earth orientation parameters, but it's by far not continuous because it's so expensive. Um, this measurement that I showed you was like a once in a lifetime where they took like um, two weeks or so continuous data. Um, but usually they just look, they use the telescope networks for Earth orientation and determination for let's say half an hour, Monday, half an hour on Thursday. And then they need to have models to interpolate between these, these measurements. Um, there's different models. These models disagree and they've never been validated. Which is kind of crazy, right? I mean, the entire geodesy and astronomy communities 
rely on models for the short-term short -term variations would have never been tested or validated or whatever. And by aliasing effect, they can sort of, of course, penetrate to the, to the long-term measurements as well. So we kind of, together with astronomers in Bonn and the Odyssey people, identified this as sort of a global shortcoming of this entire VRBI thingy, and are now trying to look at um, ways to um, do continuous measurements of Earth orientation or Earth rotation um, beyond VRBI to support VRBI. Yeah, so it's not only the long-term factors that I showed before, but it's also the, um, the short-term ones of course, the tides is 12 hours and they are not captured in the VRBI models. But of course, you need to know what they are because people do measurements every once in a while and they have only very short measurement time and they're not doing 24 hour averages, but they have for some program like one hour here and an hour here. So they need to know what is the short term variation. Okay, um, so I go home and go to bed and I dream about a highly sensitive device. They can do continuous measurement with a high bandwidth. I want to have real time data available and it should be transportable, it should be robust, it should be cheap. And then I'm from the optics community, so I remember Zanyak. This is um, sort of the old um, version of the Zanyak interferometer. I will be quickly on this one here. This is a Michael Zengel experiment, one of my most favorite historic experiments, um, where they used in a uh, hundred years ago the Zanyak effect to prove that Earth is rotating, and they could measure rotation of Earth to within a percent level without lasers, without electronics, just sort of classical <laughs> light sources and classical detectors. And so this is one of my most famous experiments. So um, this is an, was an sort of looking at shifts of an interferometer fringe. So it was in the end of phase measurement. Now we would jump from the phase measurement 100 years into the future um, to a frequency measurement. So now we have a Zanyak and we look at frequency differences of two longitudinal modes in a ring geometry, one node say this way, one node and um, counter propagating. And then if this entire thing rotates, we know what the Zanyak effect is and you see a, a frequency difference between one node and the counter propagating mode. The relation is very simple. This is Zanyak frequency, um, omega is the rotation rate of our system. And that's what we call a scale effect in between, which is four over the wave wavelength times the path length times the enclosed area. And of course, it's a product of the of the of the of the um, vector of the of the surface towards the, the rotation vector. Um, most of the gyroscopes so far are, are square, so this simplifies. So you have L over lambda as the scale factor times the rotation rate times the projection angle of the area onto the rotation. Um, and the scale factor is kind of intuitive, right? It's the number of nodes of a standing wave that you can put in the optical path length. Um, and if your length is like a meter and the wavelength is about a micron, this 10 to the six. So this is just an amplification factor. The Zanyak effect amplifies your mechanical rotation rate to the beat of two, of two light fields, which we can then measure. Okay, and if you want to measure this with high precision, of course, you need to make sure that the scale factor is constant at the level that you want to measure, and also the projection angle is constant. Okay, um, then some of you in the field of geodesy probably know this gross ring, the G-ring in Betzel, where people did exactly this. They have a four by four meter ring laser. This is a helium neon laser. So right in the center here, they have a neon discharge, helium neon. So this is on lasers on two modes, one running this way, one running the other way. And then behind the mirrors here, they pick up a little bit of light that leaks throughout the, out the windows and look at the beat and then measure the, the Zanyak frequency. This is a huge endeavor, let's say. Um, it's in, an, it's in a, um, a man-made cave under a little hill and then it's sort of sitting on some concrete pillars. It's sort of grounded onto the massive rock and it's temperature stabilized and pressure stabilized and whatever. So this is more like an observatory, not like a tabletop experiment, but uh, many 10 million euro, many 10 year um, construction site. This is the performance. Ah, I, didn't I didn't talk about the sensitivity, I'm sorry. So sensitivity of such devices is um, in the end, the scale factor. Um, so the wavelength you're using divided by the length squared of your arms, one over the finesse, um, and then the short noise scaling of the photons that you can use for detection. Sensitivity that this G-ring achieves is 12 picorat per second per root hertz. Remember the earth rotation rate is 22 micro radians per second. Then this is the well-beloved energy deviation. 
So you see that average down here. So during is the lowest curve, but it averages down. And then at um, about three hours, um, um, hits, the, hits the floor and starts to increase again. The number we need to remember is um, after about three hours, they have a sensitivity that reach 10 to minus eight in earth rotation rate, which is about a millisecond in, in real time. And this then allowed them to measure a few years ago this black data here. So black data is the um, G-ring, the, the gyroscope. And you see that they can, within a little bit, like more noise than via the eye, but they were able to, for the first time, um, sort of record the um, irregularity of earth rotation um, throughout the day. At the level, maybe it's an error of 10% or so, um, but there was, for the first time, you could use Sanyak to measure the variation, the sub-daily variations in earth rotation. Okay, um, now 10% is nice, but you see that you would need more to reach the sensitivity that VRBI can provide. So you would dream of something that's 100 times more sensitive. You want to remove and control this long-term drifts. I could, we could talk an hour about why the steering does not reach its design sensitivity and why it's drifting. So the most obvious thing, uh, I think I will talk about this later, um, they put stuffs inside the sensor, right? They have a hyphenous cavity and they put the helium and gas inside and they're excited. And for your clock people, for example, you know that the, the cavity you have should be empty, right? You don't want to put stuff into a cavity because it's of course we need to, need to um, bad things happening. So um, I want to, and this is leading to, to many sort of uncontrolled long-term drifts and everything. I want to operate continuously. I need to control the tilt and want this to be scalable and transportable. So what we are proposing is to go from this, um, what we call an active ring laser to a passive ring laser by moving the gain medium outside of the sensor. So in the end, we use an external laser and lock that one to the two modes of the cavity of, of the ring. And that is on the bead of the RF that we put into, into AAMs to lock to the two rings, we directly have the, the, um, the, the bead node. So um, this was the, the main limitations. So you have the stuff right within the sensor um, which we can remove by sort of moving the laser outside before. Um, the, so the gain width of helium neon is much, much larger than the free spectral range of the ring. So this thing lasers on many, many longitudinal modes. You have mode competition, which you don't want to have because this thing needs to run only on one longitudinal mode. What you do is you do mode starvation. You operate just, just, just above threshold. So it's running only on one node. But then first of all, it's unstable. So it's flipping back and forth between different modes. You have unequal power distribution for the two um, to, to, um, to the circumstances. So one way this one, the other way. Um, and you can extract only very little power for, for your beat measurements. So they have like nanowatts of power. So they're dying on the, on the, um, on the photon shot noise. This you can avoid by sort of locking external layers and you can put, I don't know, a lot of power onto it to saturate your photo detector. And um, they are limited to um, helium neon wavelengths which is not where you want to have, where you can have optimal coatings and crystalline coatings and so on. So if you use an external laser from the outside, you can choose the wavelengths, so you can choose the coating that um, suits you best. So this is our, say, our dream. Um, we want to have a 3D tetrahedron um, with four similarly looking cavities. Um, this allows to cover the full rotation vector Plus, it's sort of um, you have you need would need only three, but you have four. So you can look at systematics. Um, you would like to use 50 and 50, so you can use crystalline mirrors and fiber lasers and everything. Um, you can pre-stabilize your laser to some some external cavity. You're starting out already with a stabilized laser. You can use sort of um, low bandwidth um, feedback for for locking to the to this ULE uh, for this to this gyroscope. Um, we think about like a meter arm length, um, which would still be kind of transportable. Um, and this would then give a design sensitivity of 0.1 picurat per second for rotors, which is a factor of 100 better than what the Jiren can do today. Okay, um, so this is our, our, our vision, let's say. What we're setting up right now um, is um, one of these um, commercial Menlo lasers here that gives you um, certain um, numbers and drift instability. And then we have a design we first wanted to use next zero, but it's hard to come by these days. So we're using ULE spacer and we're starting up with 30 by 30 centimeters, everything in a vacuum tank that's already um, um, designed and purchased. Um, 
Then we have these tilt meters, which I just learned are also in the in the um, in the drop tower in the in the um, what's it called the ELBI. ELBI. <laughs> um, they can measure tilts to sub nanorad. This is sort of technology from BETSA. And then we also use these fiber optic gyros to, in the beginning, know what we are doing. They have um, sensitivities of five nanorad per second per root root, so they sort of allow us to get started, let's say. And then through collaboration, we have access to three geodetic observatories. One is in Totenfeld, um, that's seismically very stable, that's close to Bonn. And then Walferdang is where the Bonn geodesy people have their gravity meters and everything that's in the, in the Netherlands. And then Konrad is even deeper underground, that's in Austria where we also have access to where we can put our stuff in the end. And then uh, very recent development um, is in the context of the Einstein telescope, which I believe groups in Hanover are also relating to. Um, you know, the, the people believe today that the limitation to the performance of the Einstein telescope is going to be Newtonian noise, which is um, uh, um, compression or density variations of the surrounding that is not like a, a length change, not a compression, um, but just the density fluctuation, which then changes the gravitational potential and looks like a gravitational wave, but it's not it's just sort of groundwater levels uh, moving or uh, tilt or dynamic rearrangement or density changes or whatever. That's not seismic. So it's not associated to accelerations. It's not also not associated to length changes like real world length changes, but just sort of changes in gravitational potential which is what we're searching for. And then there's models that say that these um, compressions and change in the density of the surrounding should also move around the, 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 the earth in some way. And this should um, be measuring as local rotations. So the idea is to have 300 meter deep boreholes at the level of where the Einstein telescope is to put rotation sensors in there to measure, have a, an array of local um, rotation sensors. And if this works, then this has the potential to solve the main limitation of the Einstein telescope. And that's why people are pretty crazy about this. <laughs> um, so the far-fetched idea is to, these boreholes are six inch, so like 15 centimeters. So to miniaturize everything and put these three gyroscopes um, underground to have an area of rotation sensors underneath. And if this works, let's see, um, then this could solve the main limitation to the, to the Einstein telescope. Okay, I went over time already. Um, I want to thank you for your attention and inviting me here. And most of all, I want to thank the team and Don um, for doing all this work. Okay, thank you.